All right, everybody, here we go. I have uh, prepared our alternate assignment here for uh, the forestry trip that you all are on this week. And for those of you that aren't on the forestry trip, well, you're at home and you're able to watch this hopefully and, and keep up. <clears throat> uh, so your alternate assignment is going to literally be to watch this video. We're gonna cover three PowerPoints here, the physics of swimming. We'll look at osmoregulation and we'll look at osmoregulation and excretion. Um, they're not too terribly long of PowerPoints, especially the last two are very short. The physics of swimming is a little bit longer. We'll be here a little more than an hour. Uh, and then for your lab assignment, your makeup lab assignment will be to watch this video. It's Our Planet, Coastal Seas. It's a David Attenborough video. It's a fun one. It's uh, You'll enjoy watching it. Uh, but you will have information from this on your quiz when we return to in-person classes. So be prepared for that. The day we return, you will have a quiz. We're working out of the physics of swimming and limnology module on Moodle. I know some of this uh, will be a little bit of review from the locomotion uh, PowerPoint, but we do have some new information as well to talk about a little more details on some of this information. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into the physics of swimming. And we'll talk a little bit about how fish swim and uh, what makes that what kind of physics make that possible. So first of all, we've discussed in the past that not all fish swim and not all swimming fish are fast or efficient. But in order to swim fast, all fish have the same constraints due to physics. So thus, fast fish tend to look similar because they have phys they all have the same physics that they're dealing with. So in order to be a fast fish, you've adapted certain characteristics and probably other fish that are fast have adapted those same characteristics. Because again, you're all dealing with the same, uh, uh, you know, relatively the same conditions. Let's review the, the properties of water as a medium through which to move through. We've Again, we've talked about this before a little bit, how water has an 830 times greater density than air, and it is more viscous by 70 times than air, meaning it's harder to move through than air is. Uh, some things we didn't discuss was that fish essentially are birds of the water, right? They can, they're essentially flying around the water. And so they are kind of subject to some of the same forces that are exerted on birds. Uh, but instead of, you know, moving through air, that's 830 times less dense than water, fish are moving through water. So they get a little bit more support. It's a little bit easier. They don't have to have the same adaptations bird do. In fact, they can have a lot of different adaptations. They don't have to always be high up in the water column. There's all kinds of other uh, uh, factors here that are gonna affect the way a fish moves and what it needs to move. Uh, but, but in general, you can think of fish as the, the birds of the water and, and they you need lift. They have to have lift in order to get off of the ground. Uh, and lift is just the force that's exerted on an object perpendicular to the direction of flow or the movement of the water or air, if you're talking about birds, water, if you're talking about fish. So lift is that force that's exert, exerted on that particular object based on the direction that it's moving. And it's proportional to the area over which the, pref, the pressure difference acts. So what do I mean by that? Well, think about a wing of an airplane. You've learned this for a long time since you first heard about Orville and Wilbur Wright. You talked about some of the um, physics of flight when we were in elementary school and moving on up through your entire education. We'll talk about it in ornithology if you haven't had that class already. If you have, we talked about it a little bit in there. Uh, but essentially, you have uh, air or water, in this case, moving over an object. And on one side of the object, you have a different pressure than on the other side of the object. And whichever side of the object has less pressure on it is going to allow the object to be pushed in that direction. And this creates lift. And in water, it behaves much like it does in air. So just think about air and water kind of being similar. Uh, you know, of course, air is mainly a gas. Water is a fluid. But the dynamics of gases and fluids can, can react very similar to each other. 
Another uh, physical thing that you need to think about uh, is drag. So drag is 830 times greater in water than it is in air. Uh, it increases with the speed of the object or the current. So if the water's moving faster, you have more drag. If it's moving, fa I'm sorry, if it's moving faster towards you, you have more drag coming over your body. Uh, if you're moving with the current, the current is actually, there's a relative speed of current there if you're moving with it. So it's, it's less. Um, so think about it in that terms. If you're moving with the current, you'll have less lift. If you're moving against the current, you'll have more lift, le more drag pushing you one way or the other. Uh, and then uh, we need to talk about separation of flow uh, from an object into turbulent flow. And we're going to talk details about that here in a minute, about how separation works and how turbulence works. Uh, but essentially, if you're an object and you're in the middle of a flow, whether it's air or water, you're interrupting that flow in some, some manner. You're causing turbulence to happen. And, and along those lines, we're going to talk about boundary layers, laminar boundary layers or turbulent boundary layers. Uh, and laminar just basically means it takes place along a constant streamline, so some kind of constant flow. Uh, and turbulent means it moves in an unsteadily or violent way, the flow does. Again, we're going to discuss a little bit more about this shortly. Another important thing to think about when you're thinking about the physics of swimming is this number we call Reynolds number. And Reynolds number is a ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. So it's the forces of movement in relation to the forces of uh, what basically drag. Uh, so you can think of Ren Reynolds number as an equation and then as length of the object times the velocity of that object times the density of the fluid that the object's moving through, all divided by the viscosity of the fluid that the object's moving through. And if you calculate all that out, you will get Reynolds number. Uh, and when you look at Reynolds number, basically what you're trying to determine is, uh, is this a turbulent flow or is this a um, not a turbulent flow? Is it a smooth flow? Flow changes from, turb from uh, not turbulent to turbulent at a Reynolds number of 2,000. So turbulent flow happens because of increasing speed of water, increasing or, or of the object moving through the water, increasing length of the object moving through the water, uh, decreasing viscosity of the water, increasing density of the water or liquid, whatever liquid we're talking about, and boundary layer changes. Uh, the boundary layer changes from not turbulent to turbulent as Reynolds number goes from 5 to times 10 to the fifth power to 5 times 10 to the sixth power. So this, this is where the change place, this is where the change takes place, where we would say anything that you get a Reynolds number of less than five times 10 to the fifth power is not turbulent. Anything that's a Reynolds number of five times 10 to the sixth power and above is turbulent. So some examples would be things like a whale, which uh, moves at 10 meters per second, which is pretty darn fast, but you think about the size of a whale, uh, it's probably just going to have to move that fast. If it's moving, it's moving quite a bit. It's moving a, a couple meters at a time. Uh, and that gives us, um, you know, you think about their big body and how that would affect uh, velocity and the density of the fluid and all that moving around it. Uh, gives us a Reynolds number of 300 million. That's really high, of course. And then tuna which move 10 meters, also move 10 meters per second, but have a much, much smaller body, have a Reynolds number of around 30,000. I'm sorry, 30 million, 300 million to 30 million. A copepod, which doesn't move anywhere near as fast, 20 centimeters per second, has about 300 for its Reynolds number. And a sea urchin, sea urchin sperm, excuse me, which moves, but doesn't move incredibly fast. It moves 0.2 millimeters per second. 
it has a Reynolds number of 0 0.03. But if you think about, you know, the, the shape, it's probably not super aerodynamic. <clears throat> and let's look some more about the physics of swimming. So for efficient swimming, uh, it's important to avoid separation of the boundary layer from the surface. So this is a little more detail about what we were just looking at. Um, you think about an object moving through a fluid or air. It's the same, going to be the same picture for both. Uh, if it's a if it's a cylinder, so think about this being a ball, all in a um, in this. Uh, well, it could be a cylinder. It could be a sphere. Let's look at a spit cylinder for this example. Um, so we don't have to worry about water coming around the sides. Basically, we've got um, the water hitting the front of the cylinder. Some of that water is going to move under. Some of that water is going to move over. As that water moves over, it creates what we call this boundary layer. And this boundary layer is, um, is again, just the area where uh, you can think of it as the airfoil um, or anything like that. It's where the... Um, it's where the water is coming off of the object itself, and it's causing a difference in flow. The thicker that boundary layer is, uh, the the um, less efficient swimming you're, you're having as a fish. So you want to maximize laminar flow in the boundary layer. In other words, you want to maximize smooth, quick flowing water over the boundary layer. If you have a turbulent flow going over your boundary layer, then you're not going to be able to move very fast. You've got turbulence. You've got things moving around. You're not getting a smooth motion. You're not very, you're not moving very aerodynamically through the water, uh, and th thus you're not moving very quickly. So to maximize um, laminar, to maximize efficient swimming, you want to maximize the laminar flow in the body in the boundary layer. So in this layer. Where the fish's body meets the water, you want to maximize laminar flow. You want to also want to minimize turbulent flow created by wake or drag happening behind you. Uh, so again, this has to do with the fusiform shape being torpedo shape, being aerodynamically shaped. How big are your fins? How thin is your peduncle? Uh, how thick is your body? How wide is your body? How tall is your body? All of this plays into... Um, how much drag you're creating in the water. Uh, and you can think of this as an aspect ratio. Um, you know, the body thickness of a, of a fish. So to be a streamlined body, the fish needs to have a tapering body. And it needs to have an aspect ratio of about 0.25. And you can see how to calculate aspect ratio here in the picture. So you've got length. Uh, divided by, or sorry, width divided by length will give you your aspect ratio. Um, and in here we have drag coefficients for various aspect ratios. You can see as you get a wider body, you have more drag. Um, and in a fish, the maximum thickness of the body, we're talking about A here, is going to occur in the front third of the body. For a good, efficient, streamlined body, um, this will be where the maximum thickness, this will be the thickest part of the fish would be right here, the one-third from the front of the head. And again, not all fish maximize their, their, um, their, their physics here. Some fish are going to have a nice wide body. They're not going to move very fast. That's the, that's the idea. But for super fast swimmers, this is what they're trying to do. They're maximizing this aspect ratio. <clears throat> uh, and for these fish and the drag reduction, the key is to reduce drag, but also keep the body rigid. So if they, um, if you know, they became so streamlined, so skinny, and didn't have enough skeletal. Uh, support here that they just became basically like a jellyfish and they weren't a very rigid body anymore and they wouldn't be able to move their fin back and forth and really um, uh, give themselves some uh, some push to their swimming. Um, so there needs to be a certain form of rigidity in the fish's body to again maximize 
being, you know, speed and um, and how much effort they have to put into getting that speed. So the more rigid you are, uh, the help, more helpful that can be uh, for a fish like a tuna, which has a really thin caudal peduncle. Um, tunas are very fast. They're all about reducing drag, keeping their body rigid so that they can move that tail um, and be keeping their bodies rigid and being thin enough to reduce that drag. That's the importance of the rigidity. A slime, slime layers also help to reduce the frictional drag on a fish. Uh, so, of course, you anybody in here that's caught a fish before, hopefully every single one of you has held a fish in your life at this point, uh, you'll notice that fish are usually covered with a slime coat or a little bit slimy. Uh, that slime coat helps with a lot of things um, as far as osmoregulation, keeping uh, foreign body substances out of the body, um, other kinds of uh, things that uh, important functions of a fish's body. But one other thing that the slime layer does is it reduces frictional frictional drag on the fish. So this helps them to move through the body or move through the water body more efficiently. Uh, of course, rush rough surfaces like uh, teni. Um, if you remember, we, we looked at scales that were very similar to this. Um, and when you have these kind of rough surfaces on the scales that helps to keep the boundary layer attached. It helps to keep that slime coat attached to the fish, basically. Gives the slime something to stick to. Uh, swimming modes. So we've talked a little bit about this before. We talked about active swimming mode being able to be sustained for hours or days. Think about, uh, um, I think it was tuna that was able to swim very fast and they were able to sustain that for a long time or burst swimmers that are only able to do these large uh, bursts and they only can go for a certain amount of time because they run out of energy pretty quickly, but they can swim really fast. They just can't do it for very long. Uh, large fish fish have the greater difference between burst and active than smaller fish. It takes some more energy to move a larger body. Active swimming is accomplished using red muscles. We talked about this before. Along the sides of the fish, those that red muscle has high myoglobin in it and high mitochondrial enzymes. Burst swimming uses white muscle uh, that has greater con contractile speed but low endurance. And again, we can go back to our lectures on muscles uh, to remember how fish fish musculature how they how the difference between white and red muscles. We've also talked about this before, whether or not the fish is using its entire body to swim, or is it just using its fins to swim? Certain fish do do different. Uh, I encourage you to go back to that lecture if you're if you're having trouble remembering the difference between fish that swim with their trunk and tail and fins that just use their fins. Of course, this this goes back to anguilliform, caraniform, subcaraniform, and thuniform swimming. We're going to review this again. I, I know that we've talked about this before, but we're going to just go right back through it again, talking about body and caudal fin pro propulsion. So again, just using the fins, the body and the caudal fins to, to move through the water. There were a few different versions. Anguilliform, the entire body wiggles and undulates like an eel. Uh, these fish tend to be laterally flattened. They're having elongated bodies. And this is an inefficient form of swimming. It takes a lot of energy to not go very fast or very far. Uh, I know this is review, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, Subcarangiform. These are the folks that just swim with their posterior portion of their body. So less than one wavelength uh, bending, one, less than one light wavelength. Um, and they tend towards a truncate, rounded, or emarginate tails. Their heads, um, the head still yaws with the motion of the swimming, so their head moves back and forth. Uh, the aspect ratio of the tail is one and a half to two, so they don't bend incredibly far, but they bend a little bit, less than one wavelength, but they bend. These would be cods, basses, trout, and other fish. And then carangiform, excuse me, less than half to one third of the body flexes, so you know, we've got subcarangiform, you're talking about just the posterior portion of the body, flexes less than one wavelength. 
Karanga form, you're talking about less than half to one third of the body flexing. Uh, so a little bit more of the body, not just the tail, but just under half of the body flexes. Uh, these, this, these fish typically have narrow peduncles. They have flared and strongly forked or lunate tails. They have a high aspect ratio uh, between their, uh, on their tail. This is, again, these are the fish that swim really fast. So the herrings, the jacks, some of the scumbirds, scumbirds, excuse me. And then thunaform, these are the extremely stiff-bodied, uh, narrow peduncle, high aspect ratio tails. They have large tendons that support muscular energy transmission to those tails, and they have stiffened tails. So these are our really fast swimmers, the things like tunas and marlin, sailfish, and sharks. And then ostraciform. Hopefully you remember ostraciform. These were the weird fish, the ones that they move their tail, but the rest of the body is rigid. Uh, think about boxfish and porcupine fish. Remember they have kind of that tail that's on like a hinge where they can just move the tail and the rest of the body just stays perfectly still. Now let's look at the fish that swim using their median or paired fins. Uh, you know, these are the, the dorsal fins, or I'm sorry, not the dorsal fins, the pectoral fins or the anal fins or the, um, uh, the medial fins. Uh, so things like uh, the ragiform movement that would be uh, moving or undulating the pectoral fins from front to back with a wing-like flapping. So think about skates and rays when you think about ragiform. Didontiform, these are fish that undulate only their pectoral fins. Uh, they, do, they do that for sculling and maneuvering around. A uh, labraform are fish that oscillate their pectoral fins for sculling and maneuvering. So you've got um, undulating versus oscillating. Amiaform or or gymnot, sorry, gymnotiform. Uh, these fish use undulatory waves of the dorsal and or anal fins. And also um, and these would be things like the uh, amia calva, which is the bow fin. Uh, or the uh, gymnotids, which are the knife fish. So if you can think about, they're either um, uh, undulating just this anal fin or they're undulating just the pectoral, I'm sorry, the dorsal fin up here. Um, this would be things like seahorses or other things that have a narrow base dorsal fin. Uh, Belastiform. Uh, these are fish that use a simultaneous motion of their dorsal and anal fins. Uh, the example we used when we covered this before and also now would be trigger fish. Uh, it's also used in, to some extent by eels and persids and flatfish. So it's important to note that some fish use multiple forms of swimming. Uh, tetrodontiform. These are uh, both the dorsal and anal fins move together. Uh, to, and they move together to each side. And you'll notice that you've got a dorsal fin and anal fin set way far back on the body. Your caudal fin's almost directly attached to both of those fins. Uh, and both of these two anal and dorsal fins will move together uh, to get the fish to move. Let's look at some non-swimming locomotions. Again, we, we've covered this before, but let's just re review a little bit. So gliding would be above the water. An example would be flying fishes. Uh, they add to their takeoff propulsion by using their tail lobe in the water like a propeller. So after even after they're out of the water, they're going to move their tail back and forth to kind of keep them up in the air. Uh, flying fish or gliding fish technically can fly up to 400 meters and as high as up to five meters. We saw that video where we watched them get up pretty high in the air. Remember, there was a trade-off between getting too high and having birds catch you and being too low and having other fish catch you. Uh, they may add pelvic uh, fins and secondary as secondary gliding surfaces. Some of the members of this group, flying fish don't typically, but some of the others do. Uh, scorp 
Scorpania formies, the flying gunards. They they do that. They have these huge pectoral fins that help them fly. Very similar to the flying fish that we looked at before. Some other forms of non-swimming locomotion include burrowing. So things like eels, gobies, flatfish, and rays can all burrow under the under the substrate. Uh, wriggling eels will wriggle their body back and forth to get just to move. Hitchhiking, things like remoras and lamprey will attach themselves to other fish and just kind of hitchhike around the water. Uh, push and hold. Uh, gobies use their pelvic discs and lampreys use their oral discs to kind of push uh, up against a rock or uh, some kind of hard substrate and hold themselves to that substrate. Sometimes that substrate's other fish, particularly in lampreys. Uh, some other forms of non-swimming locomotion include walking or climbing on pectoral fins. Uh, walking catfish and mudkippers are good examples. Uh, also, the batfish will do that underwater or will, will walk on the bottom. Sea robins um, will also do that. They'll walk on modified uh, pelvic fins. Here's some other interesting um, examples. The tripod fish has these really long fins that it uses to, to kind of walk along the bottom, and it looks really, really weird. And then we have leaping or jumping out of the water. So this would be uh, things like mullets, tuna, sailfish. Some of the salmons will all do this moving upstream. They jump out of the water. Of course, some carp do it. There's, there's several fish that jump out of the water. And finally, jet propulsion. We watched a video of a frogfish doing jet propulsion before, so I'm not going to do that again right now. YouTube will flag me for playing videos. But remember what jet propulsion looks like in fish. And they accomplish this by forcing, uh, forcibly ejecting air or water, uh, in this case water, out of their gills uh, by their operculum. And that is used as an assist to fast takeoff from the ground. Uh, this is used by some persids, sculpins, uh, frogfish. Um, passive drift would just be letting the currents take you as where, where it wants to. This would be uh, accomplished in a lot of larval fish will do passive drifting. Also, some of the sargassum fish. <clears throat> and that actually finishes up that PowerPoint. I know that was pretty darn quick. Uh, but like I said, a lot of that was review, particularly when we got into the locomotion uh, portion there. Uh, but do remember that any of the anything that we've covered in class, anything I say in a PowerPoint can be used on a test or a quiz. So make sure you study, you're familiar with all that information. And yes, I could retest you on locomotion because we did cover that today. Uh, now let's uh, finish up. We got two more PowerPoints to do. They're both very short. They're much shorter than, than even that one. Uh, this should hopefully get us within about an, an hour time frame total on our recording, which would be how long our lecture is supposed to last. So we're going to talk about osmoregulation in fish. And let's first talk about the problem of osmomolarity. Uh, so fresh water has about five, zero to five parts per trillion of salt in it, whereas salt water has 35 parts per trillion salt in it. So if you're a fish, you have to deal with this in some manner. Whether you're a fresh water or a salt water fish, you have to deal with the fact that you, number one, need some salt in your body to function. And number two, you don't need too much salt or too little salt. So if you're a freshwater fish, the issue is you, you need to get salt from somewhere. If you're a saltwater fish, the issue is there's salt all around you and you need to keep it from inundating your body. And so we call these two differences hypo, I'm sorry, hyperosmotic and hypoosmotic. So if you're a hypo, hyper, gosh almighty, if you're a hyper osmotic fish, that means you're probably living in fresh water and you're trying to get salt into your body as opposed to keep it out of your body. And if you're a hypo osmotic fish, then you're probably living in salt water and you're trying to keep the salt from getting into your body because you've already got it's easy enough for you to get it. You don't need all of the salt from the water you're swimming in to come into your body. 
Uh, and so along these lines, fish can either be steno or urihaline in terms of their salt tolerance. And if you remember, we talked about uh, stenothermal and ure urethermal when we talked about animals way back in wildlife management and, and what they can deal with in terms of their range of temperatures. Uh, if you'll remember, steno means tolerating a narrow range and ure means tolerating a wide range. Haline means salt. Anytime you see that uh, suffix haline, you should think salt. So stenohaline fish are uh, fish that tolerate a limited range of osmolarity. In other words, they don't tolerate much salt in their body. And urihaline tolerate a wide range of um, osmoregularity. Why would that be useful? Well, if you're a saltwater fish, you want to be able to tolerate more because you're going to be dealing with more salt. So let's talk a little bit about how fish deal with osmotic misfits. In other, in other words, being a, a freshwater fish in saltwater or being just a fish in general uh, or being a saltwater fish in freshwater or, you know, being either mix of the two or just dealing with um, the fact that you're an animal in an environment that you've got osmotic pressure on you all the time and you need to be able to deal with it. So one way to deal with that is to be an osmoconformer. These would be things like the hagfish. And those uh, those fish just maintain an iso, the maintain constant, uh, basically osmotic condition. That's what isosomic means. They, they maintain a kind of a constant condition. So they maintain the same osmotic pressure. Uh, constantly. <clears throat> you could be a salt supplementer. So these would be things like marine elastomobranchs and the coelacanths. Uh, and to be a salt supplementer, you would use high urea content and TMAO, which is uh, trimethylamine oxide, these are chemicals in your body. You would use those to supplement your salt intake and uh, keep yourself from getting too much you would have low permeability to salt in getting into your body, but you would also excrete excess salts that build up in your body. So you got a high urea content um, and you have, that means you've got a lot of, you got a very concentrated urea. Your urine is very concentrated. You don't let much salt permeate your skin and anything, and any time you can, you excrete salt from any any orifice that are able, able to do that. So it depends on the fish as to where they're going to excrete that salt. Hypsosomatic fish, things like marine teleost, tend to have, uh, they live in loose water. I'm sorry, they tend to lose water uh, and they replace it by drinking. Uh, so their water gets lost through osmoregulation and they replace it by literally drinking water into their mouth. The gills then also will pump in water and they'll exclude salts. Uh, typically these fish, if they drink water, they drink salt water, they've got to have some method of dealing with the salt in their body and excreting it uh, as they move around. Uh, the hypersomatics, these are the freshwater fish. They excrete large volumes of water through their gills. Uh, their, their chloride cells will actually pump in salts because they're not in salt water. They need to get salt somehow. So they pump any salts they can get from the water. Remember, freshwater has a little bit of salt in it. Uh, and these are often urihaline, so they have a narrow range of, I'm sorry, Urihaline means they've got a wide range of tolerance, and that would be things like the striped bass, the tilapia, and the drum, which have the wide range of tolerances. Let me do some editing on this PowerPoint. That gets us to diadromous fish. So you can be anadromous and catadromous. We talked about this before. Uh, some examples of anadromous fish would be salmons, lamprey, shad. They go from freshwater to saltwater to breed. Their young grow up in the freshwater and then they head out in the saltwater, they spawn, they come back in to freshwater, lay their eggs, hatch and all that good stuff. Uh, when they do that, 
there has to be some sort of behavioral change. And usually that involves drinking water. Uh, there also needs to be some change in the kidney function to be able to process the difference in salt that they're dealing with. Landlocked species are what we call potadromous, meaning they're always in fresh water. Um, and if they do have to deal with salt, they have to do some reversion of their salt water tolerance. So if they're uh, if they were in fresh water and they or sorry, they're in salt water and they somehow wound up in a landlocked lake, they'd have to revert uh, back to their um, their uh, their larval instincts, their lar their larval functioning where they can actually process some salt water. And then catadromous fish are fish that are uh, that of course go, um, from living in salt water, that's our breeding in salt water to fresh water to live. So they live most of their life in fresh water. They go into salt water to breed. This the only example we have is is eels. They're very um, that's what they do. They're catadromous. Uh, they spend most of their life in the fresh water, and then they head out to sea to to spawn. Remember, the Sargasso Sea is where they go to spawn. We don't really know much about their spawning. Um, but that's what they do. And remember, all of these have to have some sort of osmoregulatory ability to deal with the changes in salt that they're that they're facing. And that generally involves some sort of osmoregulation within the body and then excretion of any excess waste out of the body. So this is our final PowerPoint for today. Again, it's a pretty short one, uh, so we'll be done here shortly. Hopefully you're familiar with osmosis and osmoregulation. Maybe these are words that you've heard before. Uh, just a little bit of review. Anytime you have a permeable membrane, so some, some separator that is um, you know, not completely solid, in other words, it allows some flow from one side to the other, uh, and you have one side has a different number of molecules or a different what we call osmotic pressure, then some of them, oops, excuse me, then some of the molecules are going to move across that permeable membrane to balance out that osmotic pressure, right? Hopefully we remember this from uh, you know high school chemistry and and whatnot. Uh, some terms to note here: the hypersomatic, high, hypersomotic, excuse me, side is the side that is is uh, higher in the you know the substance that we're talking about here and whatever the the charge or the solution in this case we're talking about salt so the hypersomotic side would be the side that's got more salt molecules on it and the hyposomotic side would be the side that has less salt molecules on it or solutes in this case again we're this time in this case our solute is salt so if you're a saltwater fish you're swimming through the water. The water looks like this side. It's hypersomatic. And you are hopefully hyposomatic, where you have more water than you have salt inside your body. That's kind of an important thing for a living organism. And you'll control this via osmoregulation, and that is the control of the concentration of your body fluids. Uh, of course, diffusion is the movement of a substance from one area of greater concentration to an area of lower concentration. And osmosis is diffusion of water through a per semi-permeable membrane. So basically, fish need to perform osmoregulation. And to do that, they use osmosis. And ideally, they regulate that osmosis some way so that their bodies don't just come completely full of salt if they're in salt water or completely empty of salt if they're in fresh water. <clears throat> so let's talk about some adapting to marine environment and reducing salts. So things like seabirds and marine iguanas, they take in a lot of salt. Uh, because they're, you know, in the ocean, they're swimming through the ocean, they may drink seawater from time to time, they eat food that tends to come with seawater. So they have to excrete that salt somehow. Usually that excretion takes place through their nose in a salt secreting gland. 
for sea snakes that live in the ocean, right? They're also taking in salt water all the time. They've also got to subscrete, I'm sorry, excrete that salt somehow. They'll do that through their sublingual gland, which would be right underneath their tongue. Crocodiles use their lacrimal glands, which are near the eyes. Fish use their gills. And, and in those gills, they have chloride cells that help that, help that happen. And sharks, which are fish, but uh, for this purpose, we'll separate fish and sharks. Sharks take, do their osmoregulating in their rectal gland. Uh, looking at birds, where they would excrete it from. So you have the nasal gland is up in the head. Uh, the salt starts, gets processed here. All the salt base comes from the body into here. Uh, and it makes its way down via the nasal cavity and out the nose. Guess that was just in case you were curious. Uh, fish do need to excrete nitrogenous waste, in other words, urine. Um, however, ammonia is toxic, toxic to them. So many fish don't excrete ammonia straight into the water, although uh, jellyfish do. Um, many fish need to detoxify their ammonia-ridden urine and create what we call urea. Uh, urea needs lots of water to get out of the body. Um, so if you're a fish, you're in a lot of water, but you, if you're a saltwater fish, you have to, again, regulate how much of that water you're letting into your body in order to be able to excrete urea. In birds and reptiles, we get uh, uric acid. That's a concentrated uh, version of urea. And we'll talk about that in ornithology. Uh, so there's different strategies to remove nitrogenous, nitrogenous waste in animals. Most aquatic animals, including most fish, excrete that nitrogenous waste as ammonia. Most mammals excrete their nitrogenous waste as urea or urine. And most birds and reptiles excrete their nitrogenous waste as uric acid. Uh, salt in the blood is important. You need some, but you don't need a lot. So you must regulate that salt. You must balance it somehow. Um, and in Osmo Conformer, they'll have isosomatic salt in there in their blood. Essentially, remember, that means that it's the same. They're always kind of just maintaining a, the same amount of salt in their blood all the time. They don't really ever change. An osmoregulator is either going to be hyperosmotic or hyperosmotic. Remember what those two terms mean as far as getting uh, water in or out of the body. Uh, urihaline fish are going to tolerate a wide range. And stenohaline, you're going to tolerate a narrow range. Give this all review from what we just talked about. The osmols, there's a term for you. That's the total solute concentration in moles of the solute per liter of the solution. Solute is typically going to be salt in this case, and the solution is going to be water. In hypsomatic fish, you have uh, water continually leaving the body. That's also pulling water into the body. It's continually drinking water, basically. And that water that is drinking is seawater, because this is a saltwater fish we're talking about. Uh, so once it does that, it's got to process that water, which means it's got to excrete some of it. So water is continuously going into the mouth and getting excreted through various uh, orifices in the body. Salt gets excreted through the gills. And then urine. Uh, comes out in a small amount, and it is very diluted uh, with the water. The fish itself will have less salt in it than the external environment. So that means the salt is constantly trying to get into the fish to balance that osmotic pressure. So the fish has to constantly push water out and excrete salt out to keep that salt from getting in. Freshwater fish, which don't have to worry about that, are continually uh, letting water into their body as opposed to continually pushing it out. 
They do not ever drink water because they're just absorbing water pretty much all the time. There's more salt in the fish than there is in the in the external environment. That's one of the forces that cause that osmosis to happen and pull water into the fish is the fact that there's more salt in the fish than there is in the water. And they produce a large amount of diluted urine because they're taking in a whole bunch of water into their body uh, and they've got to excrete a lot of it. So your hypos, hypoosmotic fish are taking in less water into their body. They're drinking it more than they're absorbing it. Uh, and they're excreting it pretty much constantly because they're just, they're taking up so much salt. They've got to let it out. Freshwater fish are constantly having the water absorb into their body and they want to hold on to their salt. So they don't excrete very much salt, but they excrete a whole bunch of urine. Sharks and coelacanths are ureosmotic, which means they hate, they maintain high level of urea and TMAO in the blood. And they excrete that through a salt gland um, or rectal gland um, that's in, the salt gland is in their rectal gland. Um, and they, they excrete a whole bunch of salt when they're, when they're urinating or defecating, when they're, when they're relieving themselves, they're letting a whole lot of salt out that way not much salt getting through the skin or being taken in through the mouth in these two. Hagfish are iono, ionosmotic, excuse me, let me say that again. Ionosmotic, ionosmotic, that's a fun one, which means they're a non-regulator. Their salt water concentration is equal to the internal concentration of salt in their body. So they have no reason for osmosis to take place. They do not regulate the amount of salt in their body. Let's look at some osmolarity in freshwater and saltwater fishes. So osmolarity is just the total measure of solutes or dissolved particles in the fish. Uh, if we're talking about salt, that's Na or sodium. I guess Na and Cl together make salt. So uh, sodium chloride is salt, right? Um, so sodium in a freshwater fish, you're taking, you got one. I would imagine this is parts per million or parts per trillion. And in a saltwater fish, you'll have 470. Chlorine in a freshwater fish, you're going to have one. This is, this is osmolarity per liter, I guess. And in a saltwater fish, you'll have 550. Calcium will be variable in a freshwater fish. And in a saltwater fish, it's going to be about 10. So in a freshwater fish, you have about 10 os osmolarity per liter of solutes. And in a saltwater fish, you have about a thousand. So saltwater fish has a, have a lot more solutes in their body than a freshwater fish. That makes sense, right? Uh, and here are some specific concentrations of ions in fish, various species. I wouldn't test you on these specifics, but just under, be able to understand what this table is trying to tell you. Uh, and so that's where we're going to finish for today. I think we've met about an hour between our uh, three different lectures here. So hopefully that'll be enough uh, for today. Uh, again, that covers for this week. Uh, and then next week you're off because of our aquarium trip. So you're and from our kids in the creek. You have already made up that time. So you don't need to worry about being here. Um, I am going to post a quiz that's going to go along with these videos and this lecture from today. Uh, again, you need to make sure you watch Our Planet, Coastal Seas. Information from that will be included on the quiz. I'll, getting, I'll be getting that posted as soon as I'm able. It may be this week. It may be next week. But uh, you'll, have, uh, you'll have ample time to take that quiz and get it done. I will let you know when it's posted and what the due date is. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, please send me an email. Remember that I'm going to be out of town next week uh, traveling with students to the National Wildlife uh, Society Convention. Uh, so if you need to get a hold of me, you'll have to email me. I uh, hope everybody's having a great trip on your forestry trip, and I will talk to you uh, soon.